and gentlemen, welcome back to the AO Show Podcast Season 4. We're on episode, I think this is episode 3. Welcome back, everybody. I don't think, you guys already know this person who has been on the podcast before, but before we get, hop right into it, please take a couple seconds, minutes, let the people know who you are and where you're from. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> um, well, my name's Sean Conlon. I... Uh, I'm some guy from the woods up in West Milford originally. I live in Montclair, New Jersey. I'm a filmmaker, founder of a couple companies that are doing some cool stuff around uh, marketing and uh, uh, production and such. And uh, I'm a big advocate for uh, doing right by people and doing right by people, especially in a creative in industry. So... That's me. That's who I am. I love what I do. I love my family. And uh, I love coming on the show. I love chatting. And uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Sean, it's a pleasure to have you back. I would figure that we just hop right into it. There's a lot of exciting stuff that has happened for you within the past couple of months that I've been checking out. Um, so I'll let, you, I'll, let, I'll let you take the take the floor on that. Can you tell me what's been going on since the last time we've spoke? Sure. You know what? I feel like I'm going to end up being like... Uh, you know, one of those guys that like comes on Joe Rogan's podcast, but like, you know, a couple of times a year, just like his buddy. <laughs> and then you need a Jamie. That's what you need. You need yeah. A, hey, Jamie, look that up. Make sure that's. <laughs> I do have a new co-producer for the yeah. show, but he wasn't able to come today. So. No, that's cool. But yeah, it's like uh, someone will say something outrageous. You'll be like, or you'll say something outrageous. Be like, look that up. Is that true? <laughs> I like that he does that because yeah. it's like, he's like, ah, oh, man, you know, I'm full. You know what? Um. Yeah, so there's a lot been happening. First of all, uh, have another kid. Congratulations. So Congratulations. my wife is due in uh, end of July. It's nice. a boy. We have two sons. I'll have two sons, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, we're holding out hope maybe down the road for a daughter, which would be great. Mm -hmm. A lot of boys in my in my world. Like my, I'm one of six, five, five boys, one girl in my family, one of six. Mm -hmm. My dad was one of six, five boys, one girl. You know, all of my brothers and sister have had nothing but boys. And so, and I'm having two boys. It's like, no, uh, the Conlon uh, boy gene strikes again. Um, but yeah, um, we have been um, really diving into the world of sustainability. And I'm not talking uh, uh, water reservation or, or conservation or whatever the word I'm looking for. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. not that smart, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> uh, sustainability in the creative world. <sighs> what does that look like? It's something we're trying to figure out right now, and I think we have a pretty good grasp on it, and I believe that in the next couple months, we're going to be in a really unique spot. Um, but also, there's kind of like this... There's kind of this like... Um, go out and do it, stop talking about it, like thing I've been like thinking about a lot lately. There's a lot of people who are talking the talk and I want to be about that action. I think mm. I, I, think I re referenced uh, Marshawn Lynch's uh, about that action boss last time we talked, yes. but it's one of my favorite lines ever in, in human history. Um, and I'm trying to be about that, you know, and I think more so than like, what are we doing? Uh, why are we doing it? I think is, is a really important question to ask because I could tell you about all these new things that are coming out and all these new launches that are coming out. And I might hint at it a little bit at some point in the show, but like, I think what's more important and probably what's more valuable to the audience and to anyone is why. Um, and I'm trying to live that out in my own life. Like, why do you do what you do? A lot of people do things. A lot of people have yeah. to do things, but what's your why? Um, and so for me, I'm a filmmaker. I set out to make movies. Mm -hmm. And what do most of us end up doing? Not movies. <laughs> and that's a thing, you know? It's like you could you're I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that. And before you know it, you're doing you're building someone else's kingdom your whole life. And you get to the end of your life and I'm not ancient, but I'm 32 and I'm like, "Oh yeah, I don't want to look back in 20 years and be like never really did what I wanted to do. Um, and so why am I doing the things I'm doing right now? So I can start to actually build, um, some sustainability, 
in, in especially in the cash flow world of creatives, everyone knows. Uh, in the world of, I'll give you a little brief, and maybe people who don't know or people who are starting out. The way that the independent filmmaking, photography, graphic design, all that kind of creative services work is, by and large, the payment terms and and how you get paid is the worst. It's hard to budget. It's hard to plan your life around such up and down, you know, um, and I'm sure same probably for musicians as well. Yeah, you know, this is funny because it's actually like um, something that I've even kind of been running into. Some of my business partners here, like we've been running into with charging as an artist and also something we've also, which we could also dive into, um, doing favors for friends, right? It's very hard to balance that. Um, and it's weird. I don't know how much you get it in the film field, but I know that there's a lot of people in the music world who are just starting out. And I feel like it's easy to get a lot of traction and get people excited when you drop something or you're doing something cool, but you know, your actions behind it and how you hold yourself within that is super important as well. Um, you know, with the podcast from last year, you know, I was taking DMs, whatever, you know, like just just going back and forth. People say, yo, what's up? And I would go through a whole conversation with them. Um, and sometimes it's nice when it happens organically like that. But also uh, I like to do more emails now. You know, I, I, I changed the way I've, I've approached, like, you know, if people could just send me an email and they're like, yo, and it says send from iPhone. I'm like, I don't know if this guy is serious or not, you know, because it's also it's not I, what I do is a little bit kind of different because, you know, each production and the hours that go in it could cost anywhere in between like six hundred to a thousand dollars that I would charge, you know, but I don't because, you know, I'm, I have a different business plan and how I want to produce this. Uh, but that's kind of like the struggle that I've been going into, you know, and, and sorry, I completely kind of cut you no, off. No, you're good, there. dude. But like, you know, that that's kind of what's been running through my brain. Sure. And I, and I would say there's this urge, like, listen, the Joe Rogans of the world are established and you don't need a podcast every day. Would you rather offer your audience uh, 10 nice cuts of steak or a uh, hundred uh the beef that they put in the Taco Bell tacos. Delicious, mm -hmm. but like, you know, it's a difference between eating a nice steak and, and eating the Taco Bell beef. For sure. Um, and I think that, and and look, you might get a couple gems in there, but it's like, I'd rather take the time, and I'm sure I'm working to this as a, as a video person, producer, like we're trying to build a very qualified lead um, search engine optimization, qualified leads. Like we're, we're working all that stuff because we want to attract the right people mm. to us. Like I, I've said no to work lately because of how we're trying to build things and not no to work, but like certain things that I know are going to be pain in the, you know what? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, you hey, listen, this is not worth it for me at this point in my life. And I'll give that to someone, you know, one of the younger guys to go, go, go take care of. But like even them, they come back and they're like, ah, oh, this client's a pain in the butt. And you're just like, well, yeah, versus the clients that, hey, here's what we want. Here's our scope. Here's the money. And you're like, great. <laughs> like, I, there's a new client we started working for um, who's a friend of mine um, from, uh, you know, back in the West Milford days. She, she's a fantastic, fantastic director, writer, producer, and she works at a company. And they came to us and said, hey, we want to do a project. And I'm like, okay. And she's just like, here's here's the money go do it. And here's exactly what we want. And we're like, wow, wow, wow. This is mm. great. And then all of a sudden like, Hey, the scope changed a little bit. Here's some more money. And we're like, Oh, wow. Like we didn't have to be like, Hey, you asked us for way more than we originally said we would do. We have to charge you more. Like I, I said this to you, I think last time it's, it's the uh, Thanos uh, thing you want to, we're trying as a company to say, all right, if we can collect, five or six gem clients in our gauntlet and, and, and just service those people. Like it'll be an easier life for us. We'll make good money. We'll be taken care of. And I'd rather work for people like that than just say yes to everyone and say, see what happens. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I think, I think w what was really interesting to me with that was that in the beginning of that, you were talking about, you know, saying no to people. I find that to be the most difficult thing that I struggle with now and it's tough because 
it's actually it's actually really funny because I'm I'm very in a in a similar place right now where I'm trying to change the way the people view the podcast. I'm trying to va- uh, change the way you know the the clientele I bring in, and it's not just because you know. I feel like when you start off so young and you start off something so exciting and fun and you do something the one way for so long, you know, and it's and it's paying dividends, you know, you start growing, you start growing. But there's a certain point where you grow to a point where it's like, okay, the way I was doing it before was accelerating my growth at a like exponential pace, you know, but now I'm I'm here at a at a at a higher level. And what I was doing before is not making me grow anymore. Like uh, when I started the podcast, I obviously started from my bedroom, then moved to my college, uh, uh, like uh, snuck in the college study rooms and did a podcast from there. And then finally, you know, moved up to the studio. And it was great because before it was it was it was amazing. Like it was a fun time. Like I I was begging people to come on the podcast at that point. Mm -hmm. No one took me seriously at all. And now uh, it's weird because now it's just like I can't take on everybody because now like I was so excited at the probably like november of last year because i was like wow like i have a list of like maybe like 60 people who want to come on the podcast you know it's great but now out of those 60 people now looking at it from a business perspective and being like okay i've kind of established myself i have my feet on the ground now i could stand you know before when i was just learning to to to, to walk you know it was like now it's like all right how is this podcast going to be like a little bit better you know than the last one and keep working and I keep trying to find ways around having to say no. That's what I struggle with. You yeah. Know? So how how do you approach, you know, a client that maybe you wouldn't want to work, not necessarily not want to work with, but it's not <clears throat> the direction you're going to. How, how do you say no? I think practically for, for you, just to, to affirm what you're feeling, like you need to bring on people who are going to add value to your audience. You don't need someone that's going to come on and be like super superficial or super whatever and like just talk about, you know, themselves the whole time. There's no give and take. They're not actually adding any value. What they're saying is like completely wrong. They're like, I charge clients. I gouge them. I gouge clients all the time. I don't care. You know, like they suck. I'm going to work. You know, like, like you don't need, and I'm not saying you have, but it's just like you need to vet and like, for instance, okay, how do I say no to clients, right? Like, we, uh, you know, I think I talked about this last time, but like that, that essential question, which may fundamentally changed how I do business is the question why, um, people came to me for years and saying, we need a video. And I never said why I just was like, sure. And they paid me what they paid me. No one ever watched it. It was nice. But like, again, no one ever watched it and it didn't work for them. And so now I start to ask the question why? And then I start to learn about the business and then I start to say, okay, am I actually a fit for them? Like most of the podcasts, businesses, art, like people understand, um, when you understand who you are and who your brand is, um, you know, who's not a fit for you just by looking at them, you know? And if I'm a photographer and I like doing really moody, sourcey lighting and someone comes to me with a you know, a scented candle brand that's super airy and lifestyle, I'm going to say, Hey, you're a great photographer, but you're not on brand for us. And I'm not going to hire you. Um, love you, love what you're doing, keep doing you, but it's just not a fit for us. And there's no hard feelings to that. But also it's like, that only comes from a place of knowing what you're worth and knowing what you, what your mission is and what you want to do. And so, yeah, it's like, we want to work with, you know, I, it's kind of hard because I kind of I kind of got like f- four businesses right now, um, within the same entity, and so you know one of them we're doing rentals and equipment um, for other production companies, and so if you're another production company that, or you're a single sole proprietor, or you're just someone who's has a camera and a light, like. And you need equipment for a bigger client that wants, you know, like, oh boy, let's get into it. Okay. So, please, please, please. Um, you know, and I guess this is kind of, did I answer your question? 
I'm still kind of in the process of listening it because I think I still, still think you're trying to find the way to like make sure. Them together. Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is like um, when you understand very clearly who you are and what your mission is, it's easy to to it's easy to say no. Like think of it this way, right? Your your country is being invaded and uh, you have to go fight the invaders. And then a bunch of people come together in the main hall to sign up to be a part of the resistance. And you got clowns, you got <laughs> jugglers, you got, uh, you know, a couple chefs, you got you know, all these people. Then you have a group of people who are army people, mm-hmm. you know, guys and gals that are all in army uniforms with their weapons and they're ready to go. Who, who are you picking for that mission? No. The army people. <laughs> and then, hey, I'm doing, we're doing a circus in town to entertain the whole town. Who, who are we picking? You know, it's like the clowns and we got to feed people. Like, so you're, you've niched or have a certain niche of people that listen to your podcast. You probably can identify who some of those people are, probably young creatives, young musicians, um, by and large. So it's like, who are the people that are going to come onto your podcast and bring the most value to, to those people? And so that's how you filter everything. Yeah. You know, you know, I think, I think the part I've been struggling with is really like, Maybe like the the empathetic part of it. It's hard for me to have. I think I always say this, and and it's funny because it's a principle that I followed very well when I'm dealing with my own finances sure. and my own money. Where I'm just like, business is business. Um, like you know, emotions are emotions. Like you can't mix the two, because like you know, like for example, like I've lent money to friends before, and I'm just like, hey, like I know you're my friend. I know I'm loaning you this money, but at the end of the day, like you. Like, as a friend, I was like, you could pay me back in six months. You could pay me back in a year, two years, five years, whatever. But when the day comes, that's it, you know? Like, I'm the, like, or like, you know, like, there's no in between for me. There's no, there's no nice thing because it's money. Like, I can't do anything about it, you know? And I think for me, the, it's weird because all, a lot of the artists, a lot of, you know, these creators, you know, they come to me and they have these big eyes and big dreams. And it's so funny because I see myself so much in them. And sometimes I wonder, I'm like, how did I even get to the place that I got into? Right. And there's nothing more every, like every ounce in my body when they come talk to me or ask me for something is like, I want to give, I want to help, I want to help. But you like you got to help yourself first. You know, I think that's what I struggle with the most, you know, and saying no to that. And I, I can't control them wanting to understand or wanting to learn more, you know? I would make the argument that by vetting who you have on here, and I hope I make the cut, um, <laughs> but vetting who you have on here is helping them. Because if you want to be a beacon on a hill and you want to be something that's adding value to those people who are really looking up to you and what you're doing, then like... What good is it to bring a 22-year-old up here that, again, I'm not trying to put age, but like a 22-year-old just graduated college and never done anything to just talk about like their master thesis project when you could bring up, you know, this, the person who's been in the same, is in the same field that's maybe a little older, maybe they're 28, maybe they're 35, whatever, 40, 45, whatever, and they have actual experience that that person could listen to and go, huh, because at one point, at some point, it's kind of the blind leading the blind, you know, it's like validate time um experience maturity wisdom like those things come in time and you need to be in the industry for a while and listen i'm not saying there's not prodigies and people who are you know killing it at 22 like there's great young creators who are young and doing awesome stuff but i thought i fancied myself great when i was 22 i i didn't know jack (laughs) i need to learn a lot i need to learn the business i got ripped off i got robbed i got you know, people didn't pay me, people paid me nothing, you know, like, and so you're young and ambitious and excited and you're like, oh, I, I want to hear my voice for a little bit. But for you, it's like, you need to, you need to go back to your core value, your core belief. And it's like, if your mission as a podcast is to bring value to this demographic, then for them, for you to allow them to come on is actually abandoning what your mission is and you're not aligning, you're not actually giving value to those people. And so that's how you can kind of weigh it and say, hey, I'd love to have you on. Um, we're kind of full, you know, and maybe you have to tell a little uh, half line. Like, yeah. yeah, we're pretty packed this season, you know, but definitely let's tack, let's keep track and let's get coffee, whatever, because you can watch their journey too. Hopefully they're listening, they're tracking along with some of the people you have come on, they're bringing value. 
and you meet this person in a year and they're like, I really learned a lot from some of the people that are on your show and I've been implementing some of this stuff. And then it's like, okay, young Padawan, you're mm-hmm. ready. Yeah. Um, but I think it does a disservice to just, you know, bring anyone and their mother on, on the podcast, you know, or a podcast just cause you want to fill space versus, Hey, I'd much rather listen to your podcast. If it had eight people that were of immense value to me as well as yourself, than a podcast with 42 people on it. And like maybe eight of them are good and the rest are all. Pfft. Yeah. Yeah. No, that actually does bring a lot of, make a lot more sense when I think about it as well. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Cause it's funny. I'm going to have to re listen to this conversation that we've had to remind myself. Cause it's almost like every time, like, I don't know, I'm a little bit of a sucker sometimes too, you know? And I think, um, uh, it's changed the way a lot. When I told you before, I was like, I'm trying to find ways around it. So hmm. this year, um, cause last time you were here, you were on June in Jersey. And that was like my big project where 30 uh, podcasts, 30 days. We're doing that again this year. And um, I'm very excited to announce that this year uh, for June, it's going to be, I don't want to call it like more charity, but it's like, I want to get everybody who's just developing themselves and really find the people I'm going to like vet throughout like a whole bunch of people who I've known throughout like the years who I see our musicians coming up and I'm going to have probably like one to five, no, sorry, four to five uh, big guest speakers every week who will be able to talk about all those creators that come through. So out of 30 days, 26 of those will be um, artists who are just like coming up and four of them will be like really established people who I'm actually like working with right now to make sure I could confirm and like have on. And that's kind of like, um, I think doing this, you have some work that you do for charity, for fun, you know, and this is kind of that. And then you have the things that you do that are like strictly like I need to stick to my vision, you know. But what I do want to ask you is when it comes up for why, you know, you've been doing this for a while and you you did talk about a, a little bit before how, you know, you uh, were figuring out stuff when you were growing up. And, you know, what is the why now? Like and how did you find it after all this time? Um, There are a lot. So. I posted something the other day, um, or yeah, I think it was yesterday. Um, what did I post? Was it the picture with uh, everybody on the staff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You saw that. Yes, actually. You know what? Funny enough, I could bring that up too because, funny enough, because you know I, I do a little research on all my guests and make sure <laughs> I'm like I'm like here and up to date with everything. I, I could say the gist of it, but basically, you know, like culture matters wherever you are um and you can either be someone who adds to a good culture or someone who destroys a culture like there's no you know there there are some people who are maybe uh you know silent partners in that but like for the most part you you either add to a culture or you destroy a culture you give or you take um and in this space you know to not most of us don't have the cash flow starting out to hire people full time. It's just not a thing. We're not a big company. We don't have insurance, all that stuff. So we rely on contractors and to have this like fear and poverty mindset around giving credit or giving referrals for other jobs to your contractors, because you're, you know, trying to look like a team and da, 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 da. And it's like, it's kind of just like, yeah, lame. Um, like these people, um, you know, if you only hire them twice a month, you know, and there's other opportunities for them, like they need to work and they need to, they need to make a living. And I have people on my team now that like are contractors, they have hourly set up and stuff like that. But like, I try to dish them as much stuff as I can. That's outside of even me. And if I get a call from someone who's like, Hey, I got this. I'm like, go, go, you know, go do it. Um, but people did that for me. I have, I've talked about this before, shout yes. out, shout it out literally everyone on planet earth that I know, but, um, I was starting out in the industry and they were some really good people who took me under their wing. They gave me access to equipment. They referred me all the time for other jobs that maybe they didn't, you know, cause it was maybe something that they would have done four years ago, you know? And it's like, I had a, a similar shoot a little while back that like, would I have done it five years ago when I wasn't married and have a kid? Sure. Now it's like, eh, you know, but, but there's guys on my team that'll do it and they would love to do it. And you know what? Go do it. 
you get the money, you know, like, and I just, I'm happy to do that. But there are a lot of people who don't live in that mindset. It's, it's fear, fear of, you know, it's like, and I think at some level you're like, dude, like if you're afraid that you're, 21 year old intern with an iPhone is going to steal your client, then you didn't really do a great job of retaining that client. Or it's not someone you even want to work with. Cause if they, the 21 year old with an iPhone took the client away, that means they were shopping around before they even talked to the 21 year old. That was like, I can do this better and cheaper. And it's like, you know, do you really want to work with someone like that? That's yeah. literally like throw you away. So it's, it says a lot about, you know, it's like, uh, you can get mad at the, the guy, uh, that your you know your girlfriend cheated on you with, but at the end of the day, do you really want to be with someone who would cheat on you? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. So so get mad at him all you want, but at the end of the day, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of like the point is like, what kind of clients do you want? Mm -hmm. And I think when you ask that, who's your ideal client? That's that gives you a north star to point to. Um, but you ask the question, why? Yes. So. I want to be able to reciprocate the things that have been done to me. That's a big core belief of who I am. Ferrum, which you're going to learn a lot more about today, uh, you, you know, is periodic table of elements. Mm -hmm. um, I and, and one of my favorite, you know, proverb is is uh, Proverbs twenty seven seventeen as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another, and that's been the blood, the lifeblood of like my company, the bedrock, like of how we operate giving opportunities to people and, and helping the next generation with everything. Like I want all the guys that work for me to succeed and girls, we have girls on the team too. We have a great team. We have a super, <laughs> I'll get into this later, but like, you know, all the pressure for like diversity and stuff lately. And look, there's some merit to it for sure. But like, <laughs> it's like, I love that. Like you look at our staff and our team now at the, at the company, it's like, it's all over the place. It's great. It's super diverse, but like I didn't. It seems so very artsy. You know, I'm not gonna lie. It looks exactly what it, it should be. <laughs> but I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. Like we have, I mean, across the spectrum. And then that photo was more just some contractors with a few of our team members. But like, if you go to our office on a busy Thursday, and it's like, it's awesome. But I didn't like sit there and check boxes and be like, all right, we need one person of this color, one person. Mm -hmm. It's it just it just happened. And, and it's not about that. It's about good people and good people that I trust and good people that I know are competent and will get the job done. So can you talk a little bit about how you, what qualities of a person do you look for or have you learned to like, you know? Uh, we look for fat people, <laughs> faithful, <laughs> available, teachable. Okay. <laughs> At the beginning, you got me there for a second. I was like, okay, <laughs> where is this going? <laughs> that's it. Um, no, um, yeah, faithful, available, teachable. I mean, that's that's one thing that's a little old acronym mm -hmm. that one of my friends said. But like, I don't even remember that. <laughs> but it's but it's true. It's like, and I don't mean faithful like they'll take a bullet for you, but like faithful to you. Know, there's someone that loyal, trustworthy. You know, someone that you can trust. You know, they're gonna show up on time, and if they don't, they're gonna be they're gonna take it and say, hey, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, available, you know, available, you know, I guess that kind of means being able to show up, but, but available to work, um, want to give you time, want to learn, um, and teachable obviously is another thing, you know, humble, uh, available to be taught something and open to asking questions and asking for critiques. Um, so much of the creative space, and I'm sure you know this, like you put your heart and soul into stuff and it doesn't feel good when people poke at it and say, I don't really like that. Or, Hey, this is you know not good. And you're like, Oh, but this is my best work. And it's like, I told one of my guys, I was like, you know, it's like, I wish I can go. If I ever became like independently wealthy, I'd like to go on a world tour and return a bunch of people's money back to them that paid me for work in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. Just like, Hey, here's that two fifty for that <laughs> promo. It was awful. <laughs> so yeah. Um, you know, I think those are some of the qualities. Um, I trust everyone completely. Um, but also, we said this the other day, you know, and we were talking a little bit about people, you know, in my office. Um, now we have a new office space mm -hmm. in Montclair. Shout out Montclair. Um, and in the office is like a downstairs like workshop where we work on stuff for rentals. We have an editing room. We have like a main area that's kind of like a we work, kind of like this. Nice. And then we have a garage space as well that's pretty much, uh, you know, all of our gear and stuff. And everyone has access. And we have, 
you know, security system and all that stuff. But a lot, you know, a lot of the people have access and someone said something along the lines of like, what happens if one, you know, you ever think about someone robbing you or whatever. And it's like, you know what, man, I don't want to live this life in fear of what could be, first of all, I have insurance, you know, it'd be an inconvenience, it'd be an inconvenience but obviously, you know, that's why you get insurance. Um, that makes sense. The second thing is like, there may be bad eggs one day. Currently there's none, but there may be. And I think you have to do what's best for culture and probably that sooner rather than later. Cause I do believe that one bad egg could spoil the whole bunch. And if you allow toxic personalities and people who are just like, not good, like, I'd rather have good, I don't care how talented they are, they can kill a culture and that's not good. But like, my, my whole point is like, I can't change my frequency no matter how how you behave around my generosity or whatever. I'm not going to say, all right, you know what, we're not giving out any access to equipment. Like, I let all my team, if they want to use some of the gear, just talk to Harry, a rental guy, and you have access to it. You want to shoot a personal project, there's the camera. You want to do whatever you want, there's the camera. We give all of our people deals. If they have a client that has a big project and they need to rent from us, we give them a certain percentage off and we say, charge the client the full price. You keep the, you know, the percentage. Like we try to give them every possible access to stuff. But if it's a passion project, take anything you want and go work on it and make it the best you can make it. Um, and, and look, one day someone might rip me off. Someone might take a camera and never come back. And you know what? I'd still do it. And I, you know what I mean? Like you can't change who you are because of the world, because the world's not so great place sometimes, and that stuff's gonna happen to you. I definitely feel that. Do 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 you ever do you ever feel like you give and still people don't learn? You know, or how much does do does do you teaching them also involve them kind of learning who they want to be? That's a big part of it. You know, we asking the question like, well, who do you want to be? What do you want to do is important. And I think there are no lost causes, just mm -hmm. lost, you know, people that don't have direction. Um, and yeah, I mean, people, people can learn and people can humble themselves. They can, they can do anything. I also don't know everything. I think this is a big thing. Like we have people that we really love that are part of the team and I have been a part of teams of people and now I don't work with them much anymore and it's like I just want people to succeed and if that means outside of me that's fine like Norman shout out Norman Norman's like one of my main dudes right I've known him since he was 13 I talked about him last time um he's been working with, on stuff for me for 13 years well 13 years sorry 10 years almost anyway um and he has such a bright future and I don't think you know sometimes he doesn't see it but he does and if tomorrow he said, I got a job in California working on a thing and I have lots of plans for him for the future of my company. I'd love for him to be around for a long time because I would love to build stuff and have him be a part of it. But like I would be very happy for him and hopefully still be in his life and still be his friend. I love the kid. But it's not like I'm trying to build up an army of followers for me. Like I want these people to succeed. And others did that for me. And, I, and that's just always going to be the lifeblood of who we are for sure for sure and i de I, I definitely resonate hard with that too because i've i feel it's weird my my age group right now is kind of weird um and i find myself very sometimes disconnected with my age group um i don't know a lot of people right now around my age who know what they want and sometimes i feel i struggle with that uh, that's why I've been working hard on the podcast, like being like, why am I doing this? Who am I trying to bring on? What value am I trying to give sure. people at the end of the day? Um, and it's weird because I find I find that a lot of people might come to me for maybe just like general things where I'm just like, I don't know how to help you except to like maybe like, for example, um, I had somebody who had come to me for the podcast and like, hey, I want to help you out with the podcast. And I was like, yeah, sure. I could use help. And then, like, they didn't know what, like, to do. And when I gave them stuff, they were just like, ah, you know, like, do you have anything else? I'm like, well, this is what I need. And if this is not what you want, you know, like, that's one thing. Yeah. And they're like, but I still want to be a part of this. And I'm like, do you want what this looks like and what it, it, it might be? Or do you want, like, you need to figure out you. Because what I need is you. Like, I need 
basically, I need your fat. You know, I need you to be faithful. I need you to be what was the available, available and teachable. teachable. Yeah. And you know, I think the biggest things, two things that were missing were the F and the T, which is like <laughs> there's no faith and you don't want to be taught. And you don't want to be taught because you don't know what you want. And if you don't know what you want, then that's a big that's a big problem. How do you have like I I guess I kind of asked this question before, but it's weird. Um, I think building a team is one of the hardest things to do uh, and delegate work to. And I think that's probably where I'm going to shift this more. You opened up your space, you know, and I think that's that's super commendable because I know when we got this space, I was just like, there's so much more than just like, you know, doing your day to day. How do you delegate your work and what you need to other people in your team? I'm learning yeah. <laughs> about that big time. Like, you know, we all moved into the office space January 1st. And so it's three months now. And I don't think, you know, we've gotten some stuff done. We're in the middle of building out pitch decks. And like April's our big deadline to start like really pitching. We have lead generation. We have uh, commission-based salespeople that are going to be working with us. We have about 40 contacts of people who are going to be, you know, putting stuff out to and like, we're we're all gearing up for that but i don't think i've done a good enough job as a like as a leader to set expectations and deadlines i think that's the big thing it's like if you don't know what you want they're not gonna do what you need them to do and being ambiguous and being like hey i like i, I made this example with one of my guys i was like if we owned a donut shop or bagel shop right and i'm like hey we need 100 donuts or we need a lot of donuts our bagels, let's just say. Don't you know donuts are more fun? Okay. We eat a lot of donuts. <laughs> um, you know, and all of a sudden Saturday comes around and I'm like, dude, we're supposed to have a hundred donuts today. And he's like, You never said that. You just said we need a lot of donuts. I baked forty eight. Like, that's a lot. You know, and it's like and also like they were supposed to be done by today. And it's like, you didn't tell me when. And so it may seem like you're being a uh a stick in the mud by saying, Hey, so here's what we need. We need you to cut down these pod, these three podcasts and need it done by fr Friday. But unless you say that they're going to go, well, I did one and it's, I know it's Saturday, but like, you know, that's when I could do it. And, and you know what, by clearly listing what you need, you, that they then can say, Hey, this is for me or this is not for me, you know? And I think for you and for what you're doing, like, there are probably people at some of the local colleges that would love to have some experience working on a podcast. And you could probably have two or three interns at any given day coming in and cutting down some of these podcasts. Yeah, that's that's really, I think, the next big step. And I think what's holding me from that is just really taking the time to yeah. organize myself and really like list out what I need people doing. Um, I mean, we get really into content creation. And I think that's, I've been... You know, I'll, I'll kind of give myself a pat on the back here now because I've been just taking like a Sunday and taking like five hours just yeah. sitting down in front of my iPad and like making like 40, maybe 40 shorts and then scheduling them out nice. for like the rest of the month and putting them on an automatic like um, uh, upload timer. And then even now, like um, before, like, for example, the, the difference between this podcast and the last podcast we had is that each podcast before had about three reels that I would use and I would take I would take like the three best clips out of each podcast. Right um, now, the difference is like for every podcast that I do, I well, I listen to every single podcast. I go through all the podcasts. I make notes on every single like every couple minutes now. And I make a reel out of every one of those spots. So oh, nice. maybe out of this, we might get like anywhere between 30 to 80 reels out of this whole podcast. And then instead of I'll promote it a lot during the week of and then throughout the year, I'll take random times during the year and just promote it randomly. And then that way I'll have like a consistent like Love kind of like read through. Um, yeah. And I think uh, the content creation part is is absolutely it's tough. It's super tough, and I and I actually like that um on your Ferrum uh I think it's a Ferrum Films page. I'm not I'm not sure because I, actually I follow, I don't think I follow Ferrum Creative yet because I was just looking at it today and I was like oh my god I didn't follow it yet. Uh, the Ferrum Films page, you guys did a couple of reels as well. Yeah, can you talk to me about how that was like starting out and just filming it? Because I assume for you guys it's it's super easy. So, you know, Leo. Yeah. So Leo and I 
have partnered in a new venture within the company called Ferrum Views. Mm. And so, all right. Un- unofficially, you know, we, we have, we're building out our deck right now. We're, we're getting ready to launch. And that was what I meant by like 40 something, con- like a lot of businesses. Basically, we are, we realize that there's a huge, huge, huge need for TikToks and Reels. Huge. I mean, to the point where I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how there is a massive amount of lobbying to get TikTok removed. And a lot of people say, oh, Chinese spyware. They, they, they do all this stuff. They spy on your phone. But it's like the guy's like, so does Meta. So does Instagram. So does all these things. Like they just outwardly do it. And the real reason is TikTok is eating Google's lunch when it comes to search because people go to new cities and they look on TikTok for yep. restaurants, not Google. And Google's is whole true. thing is search. Yeah. And so now you're almost, you know, it's like, and I said this to Leo the other day, and he said this to me, and it makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, I'm like, well, what about the legacy companies, you know, like Rutz Hut and all these other like big, and he said, yeah, but in a few years, in a generation, you know, those owners will be gone and they're going to need to adapt. And, and be a part of what how you're marketing your business now. And I'm like, ooh, yeah. Because I in a little while, I was like hesitant to like advertise to some of those people. But all this to say, it's called Views. It is our social me- media marketing arm of Ferrum. And it's very specifically geared around making reels and TikToks for marketing products and services for your business. And engaging ways, making them really well done. And... We're going to start, we already have a couple clients and we're building out a proof of work and proof of concept. And we're in the process of getting ready to launch our official deck and then starting to get sales stuff behind it, some promotional stuff behind it and really make a push. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that's a very interesting conversation because, uh, I can't remember the last time I used Google for any restaurant stuff. I, I actually mainly just use TikTok whenever I do that, whenever I travel, yeah. whenever I want to find stuff to do in the city. And then I look through other creators and what they're posting up to be able to do that. And um, funny enough, actually, I was making a reel the other day and I needed footage of like Jersey City. <laughs> and so I was just like, I looked up on TikTok because like, you know, you could just download the videos there. And I was just looking people who walk through downtown Jersey City just to find some shots that I could possibly use, you know, and it not be like super copyrighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. with TikTok, I mean, it's all there from, like for anybody to use. So, um, but but the big thing we're trying to leverage with that business Look, there are people that are trying their best to make good content. Time. The thing we're selling is is the business owner's time back. Because you and I both know how long it takes. And we've we've started to send out some of these proposals to a very select few small businesses. And a lot of them have come back and said, I need someone to help me manage and post and engage and all these things that are super important to the algorithm and make content because running a small business alone is a full-time job well, more than a full-time job especially if you're in the food service industry and then managing your social and all that stuff it's like poof, there's 40 hours right there every week you know yeah. if, if you look um and so time you know some of them said you know i go home my spouse gives me the stink eye because i'm on my phone I'm like, babe, I'm just answering, you know, a DM from someone. And it's mm-hmm. like time has become a big thing for a lot of people, small businesses. And then some of the good ones, you could see they hire out and they have a team of people that just do it for them because the ROI is there. And I think that's the big thing. I was having a conversation with a um, small business um, restaurant kind of place. And I was ta- talking about these um, videos for a special product. And I told him how much, you know, one of them costs. And he was like, Oh my God, that's insane for one video. And then he like thought about it for a second. He goes, Hey, I want to apologize for that reaction. He's like, I get it. You know, if someone spends like 400 bucks, 500 bucks on a uh, really well edited like TikTok, and then they leverage it and then they make like 5,000 bucks on that pro and that's the special that weekend. It's like the ROI is pretty darn good. Yeah. And so that's kind of the, some of the language we're going to be using in our next iteration of the deck is like, A, your time, but also B, like, this is how people are viewing the world and we want to help drive sales. Cause if, if we're not, if the, if this isn't equitable for the business, 
we become the first thing on the chopping block. And I don't want to sell, sell snake oil to anyone, you know? Yeah. And it's like, but again, it's a monthly strat, it's a monthly retainer based strategy. We come in and shoot um, TikToks for them or photos or whatever they want. And we go every single month, which also helps us from a cash flow standpoint. Cause again, you know, from any given point in time from the filmmaking business, it's like, we could be floating, you know, and waiting on $30,000 to come in. So it's like, all right, it's coming any day, 90 mm-hmm. days from now, you know, and it's <laughs> yeah. like, well, it's coming, you know, and it's just like, you're doing that up and down dance of paying contractors. And, and all of a sudden, like now this comes along and we start to scale this and build this and build a team out just for that. And it'd not be crazy to say that in a year's time, we can have anywhere between 50 to 60, 70 clients in that space and do it really, really well. And it, you know, it speaks for itself. It's, scalable business for sure and it's something people need you know what i thought was interesting that you're saying before that when you were talking to leo is that like you, you had mentioned for example like a place like ruts hut right and um you know like that they're gonna have to adapt you know it's weird in my mind automatically i almost disagree with that a little bit hmm. because and it's not it's not it's not for every business though i feel sure. like new businesses that that exist are gonna they have no choice but to adapt Sometimes it's weird because I find these one or two places, you know, because I like adventuring a lot. I like going to Red Hut's great. And Red Hut's oh, great. Yeah, this weekend, yeah. yeah. And there's also um, that other place in Clifton as well. Um, uh, Texas Wieners? I forget what it's called. They have Jersey big, Johnny's? Or I know what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's another hot dog place. Uh, they're known for selling um, Ripper. They called them Rippers originally because they would. Does it put, look kind of old school dinery? Yes, yes. I know exactly. It's yeah, kind of yeah. in Patterson almost. Um, actually, I think so. Yeah, yeah, almost heading there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I feel like there's some places that are so original and so like you know like laid back that I feel like them themselves like just being existing and the creators like coming up and stuff they almost have like a self kind of uh, advertising to them for being legendary. Agreed. But and and then okay, Leo. Leo I'm giving Leo lots of lots of credit today. <laughs> um, agreed. But then think about it this way. Who are usually the people you see at Rutzhut eating? Besides you. Older people. High school kids are not getting in their car and going, let's go to Rutzhut. They're going to the place with the cool mochi uh, things and the, you know, like all the stuff that's being advertised to them. And they're finding the TikToker that's, you know, and it's like there's going to be this big disconnect. It's the same thing with like. The idea of population collapse or whatever it's like when you have disproportionate members of society supporting certain industries and then all of a sudden now you know we have a big you know people between 60 and 80 are going to be dying off in the next 15 20 years it's like oh yeah so it's like yeah you might know of ruts hut because your grandpa brought you but you know the next generation is gonna be like ruts hut what the heck's that um and so that makes a lot of sense and then uh leo said something along the lines of what did he say Leo, Leo, you crazy person. You told us, <laughs> told me something to say. Oh, um, you know, we were talking about like medical and like other industries. And he was like, you know, these businesses, like, well, I remember when I was getting physical therapy for my shoulder surgery or shoulder surgery, um, I couldn't find one that had availability. So I'm like, why would they need any marketing? And clearly you look at shout out social media, social media accounts for, physical therapy are all atrocious. Uh, mm-hmm. We can help you. Um, sorry, that's not a nice way to say it. We're here to help and we love you. And, and I'm about to talk and talk a little more about this. Um, but they didn't have a problem with having people in the door. But when you listen to physical therapists talk, they're, they're very stretched thin. They're very uh, stressed out. They're overworked. They're burnt out. So Leo said like, that's not their problem. Customers is not their problem. What's their problem? And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Finding qualified people, growing their staff, attracting talent to come to them because it's like, hey, is this how you work in your physical therapy office currently? Taking on all these clients and being super bogged down and et cetera. Like, we have a really great culture here, you know, and recruiting more qualified people that want to be a part of a better culture of physical therapy as well as, you know, like – you know, growing out new facilities and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like the, the, the customer isn't always the problem. There's other things, you know, and maybe ruts hut every single time I go there, there's a sign for help wanted. And so it's like, okay, you know, there's another problem. They, they don't clearly don't retain, uh, 
workers, you know, and then maybe it's quick turnaround. So anyway, just thinking about it from different angles of like, it's not always about sales. A lot of these people can't find qualified people. Yeah. And they have plenty of sales and they can do more if they had better people, better infrastructure. Yeah. You know what? Funny, funny enough, this brings up an interesting conversation. I'm just going to hit you with some random stuff that I've been thinking about. Yeah, let's hit, hit it. Um, I was thinking about yeah. how messed up like the medical industry is. Like when it comes to insurance, when it comes to like, for example, um, I I was on my parents' insurance for a while, and I recently turned twenty five, uh, this past December, and it was like, now my insurance, uh, my dad's about to retire, and um, I'm not gonna get his insurance anymore. So I'm supposed to hold it till twenty six, mm-hmm. but now he's retiring, so I won't have it anymore. So I'll be on whatever you know, healthcare I could find. Right. Mm-hmm. But even before that, you know, I would, I was going to therapy for a while and you know, the insurance would give me so much problems with getting therapy. And, you know, when it comes to co-payers or getting paid back or, you know, like for example, um, my therapist would have to, uh, send me a check and then I would have to just be the, 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 I guess like the third party to then send that check back to them, my insurance, just so that check, uh, could be cashed by the insurance and then sent back to my bank account because I wasn't allowed to check it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of also doctors' offices. There's a, a lot of other so doctors in general who don't do a good job in their practices. And whether you know, and it's funny that you bring up you know like oh because they might be understaffed or they're un- under a lot of stress. I think I think that's 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 a really cool point to bring up because I was almost thinking I'm like why is there nobody like reviewing doctors. Why is there nobody like reviewing or like doing content creation on like what insurance companies are the best and they give like the better deals? You yeah, know? that's that's the tough part, you know, and I think my biggest hang up with like working with medical is like they have a like we're in the process of talking to a, a chain of urgent cares um, that they identify that most of their demographic are women and women in a certain age group. And so it's like they're like we have this cold clinical look to everything we do and they're like. You know, and we kind of suggested like, hey, what if we did a cross between like medical so they don't know it's they know it's somewhat medical, but maybe a little more nice, like pharma ish and like lifestyle. And they were just like, ooh. and then we warm up the images and we have a little more about, you know, it's less about people being wheeled into a thing, but more about like, you know, you want to live a healthy life and you want to have it's all these aspirational dreams. But then when you get sick, when you need something, we're here. And they were just like, oh, yeah, that sounds great to me, you know, like, um, which was fun to hear, like, people in the medical world be like, breath of fresh air in that space. And their biggest problem was they're competing with tons of other urgent cares. And, you know, it's kind of like at the end of the day, I think their their big need outside of, a, you know, a brand. Yeah, sure. But like search engine optimization, because as soon as some, the only thing that's really happening is someone gets their toe cop, chopped off and they're like urgent care all right closest one let's go you know um and yeah it's it's a dicey field i think to niche in uh, unless you're kind of already doing it like we've worked my wife worked in healthcare pharma for years i have friends that have worked in pharma i've worked on tons of pharma and like medical projects hospital videos it's kind of they're very set in their ways and it's also you know but again like leo's theory everyone that generation's gonna die and maybe Mm -hmm. that changes but yeah, there certainly seems to be no problem with people who are sick and unhealthy in America. Yeah. And so I think it's kind of like there's always going to be a market for... But even though, because it, it, just, it, just, it just blows my mind, because I know a lot of these... I don't, I, I, I don't know any doctor or any medical place where they're struggling struggling financially, you know? Yeah. And it's wild because the people who who are the people who struggle financially are the people who usually go in, you know, they're usually like, uh, and they'll get on these payment plans or the insurance will give them so much trouble. And there's just some doctors who don't care. Like even, um, for example, uh, I've been going to the same dermatologist for years. And, uh, if my dermatologist is walking, watching this for some, for some point, for some reason, just get your act together. Cause I'm about to put you on blast. <laughs> I'm not going to say your name, but I'm gonna put you on blast because you know, I'm always the type of person who I, I'm very health conscious and I've become even more health conscious since the beginning of this year. Um, 
and just knowing what I'm putting in my body and learning why something happens to my body and knowing how I can improve it and not just taking a pill because it's going to make me feel better. Like, 100%. I want to know what's inside the pill. What effects does it have? Am I going to get depressed? Am I going to get suicidal thoughts? And a lot of these things, like, for example, when I went into my, my dermatologist office, you know, I feel like that's probably the last time I'm going to go because I, I go in and I'm, I'm, I'm telling the person, hey, this is a problem I'm having, you know, uh, how, what can we do to remedy it? And they're like, oh, uh, I'm going to prescribe you this, 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 and that's it. And then, like, the appointment took, like, four, three minutes, and I couldn't even, and I was, I waited there way longer, you know, I was there for, like, an hour and a half waiting to get into the room. I got to speak with the person for, like, three minutes, and that was it. And I didn't get to ask any questions on, like, you know, why are you prescribing this? Why do you think this might be happening? And then this is where you get into the holistic side of healthcare where it's just, like, okay, are you drinking enough water? Are you doing this? Are you exercising? And a lot of things that are just not spoken about generally where we don't learn. And it's, like, you know, isn't this part of the doctor's job? You know, and I almost feel like, Man, like, I would love, like, a TikToker to be like, hey, you know, like, make the field more competitive. Not just the people who could just buy their own practice and now yeah. they're just they're just getting this influx of people in, you know? Yeah. I don't know. What, what, do you have any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts about the <laughs> medical industry. Um, I've seen a lot of doctors that are making TikTok Instagram accounts and they're adding a lot of value and they're all being labeled as kooks and misinformation and all this stuff here. Here's a big reason why, right? Right. Like COVID did some things to, uh, make uh, a lot of like, uh, bootlickers for the pharmaceutical industry. And, uh, I'd think that any average American or person, if you would ask them in 2018, like, what do you think about the pharmaceutical industry? They'll all be like double middle fingers. Like those guys are crooks, like awful, mm -hmm. et cetera. But it goes deeper than that, right? Like, and this is, okay, you can fact check. Jamie, fact check this. Um, <laughs> so when you find out that pharmaceutical companies pay for the fund, some of the funding of the FDA and the CDC, when you find out that pharmaceutical companies sponsor and, and actually make a lot of the books that these doctors are using for their studies in college and getting their degrees and their their MD, like they are being trained. It'd be like, it'd be like you're, you work for Verizon and someone's like, I need a new phone. It's like, have you considered Verizon? And they're like, uh, it doesn't work where I live. Well, yeah, but for Verizon, you know, it's, it's a good phone. It's like, you have a bias built in. Um, and I think maybe that's not the best example, but the point I'm trying to get across is like when doctors have only been trained by people who make the drugs as their intervention, that's going to be their only answer. Mm -hmm. And so you have very few doctors saying, hey, uh, take, uh, hey, what are you eating? What's your diet consist of? Um, what are you doing for exercise? Exactly what you said. Are you drinking enough water? Like, and then this gets into a bigger conversation, which I'm currently, I'm currently day four into uh, no sugar and bread. Wow. For a while. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great. Um, you know, you start to learn that in the in the seventies, uh, scientists were paid off to, by the sugar industry to say that sugar is not bad and that fat is the real enemy and causes all these issues. Um, and yeah, so it's like you know they have sugar in everything and people are really unhealthy and we eat a lot of sugar. I forget what the numbers are, but I was listening to Doctor Phil. This guy came on and said that we have more sugar in a week than we used to eat in a day in a in a whole year back in colonial times. And so you got all these people that are going, I don't eat ice cream. I don't eat any desserts. Um, you know, 39 grams of sugar in that ice cream. I'm not going to eat that. But then I'm having this smoothie for breakfast and it has mm -hmm. 39 grams of sugar. It's yeah. like, you might as well eat the ice cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like. It, it, it's it's funny that you bring this up because I actually, I went on a carnivore diet completely for about like a month and a half. I started right when I got from Peru. I was the heaviest that I, that I, I actually have. You look great, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I was the heaviest I was when I got back from Peru um, in like a while for like the past four years. The heaviest I've ever been in my life was probably like somewhere around like 265. And when I got back from Peru, I was 253, 254. 
And I was just like, wow, like, I don't know, like, how I got back to this point. And it's so funny because last year in January, I started, like, a fitness thing. And it didn't uh, come, like, it didn't, like, come to fruition, like, uh, all my goals that I wanted to do. And it's funny because as a creator and everything you, you we do, you know, it's like um, you could see yourself putting in the work. You know, you could, I could see myself four years ago when I started the podcast or three years ago when I started the podcast and I could see like, you know, there were big ups, there were big downs, but in general, it's been a, it's been a linear upwards uh, momentum or, or, or flow. And with my weight, it's the only thing I feel like in my life where I've had no control over and it's been up, it's been down. And, and I finally kind of took a, 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 a second and I was just like, I started reading up on carnivore and I don't think it's like, a, it's not a forever thing. It's definitely like, a, I needed to really relearn my body, what affects my body and relearn discipline and getting into that. And so I did all this reading. I have the book actually in my office over there. And I was, I was just going crazy into learning all the health benefits and everything what's good what's bad what's in processed foods and actually was learning that seed oils yeah seed oils oh, are like terrible you know dude, so first of all most of it is rancid they use deodorant to make them not taste rancid and dye to turn them yellow it's they insane. were they were built to be lubricant for machinery mm -hmm. and then they started using them and putting them in our bodies yeah and it's and it's it's insane and it's insane too like how you know the fda allows these things just to be put in it's wild when i was in peru one of the things that actually started opening my eyes when i came back was that the supermarkets over there like everybody would think like for peru peru is like technically third world country right i go into the supermarket and all the things that are high in sugar that are high in uh, processed fats they have a white label on it and it takes up it, it's it's pretty it's pretty sizable like you could easily read it and it just says high in high in uh, fat or it says high in sugar like be careful you know don't eat too much of this and you don't see any of that here in the united states at all um and so when i um started looking into this i think it's 32 grams of sugar uh or anywhere between 32 to 28 for men is the amount of sugar daily that you can take like fully and so i've been like now just making sure my sugars are low uh my car i'm on a very low carb diet now i've reintroduced vegetables but the month of doing carnivore really taught me like what my body can accept yeah. and what it doesn't accept. you're basically doing animal based is yeah. what, what we're starting to do now yeah. too so it feels great yeah I'm for sure and it's funny i for that whole month kid you not i don't know how i functioned around other people because and and this is just uh, this is just leading to me farting so basically i was the most gaseous person i knew i burped all the time like with my friends in the car they would always have me like i'd be driving and then randomly i, I roll down the window and they see me go like this and i come back and then like they know now since hanging out for me for so long they're like oh he's just burping right because i would hate burping in front of people because it also smells like i'm like what what is wrong with my stomach and so you know learning all these things for that whole month of carnivore didn't even fart didn't i didn't have to mm -hmm. i when when i would wake up i would just release mad methane <laughs> like, <laughs> like i don't know how else to put it like yeah. it's the first thing I, I would have to do but like now like it's like so much more relaxed like you know and if i do want to have a meal here or whatever like or if i want to have a burger or anything it's so much easier to kind of go with and now getting into a workout routine too you know so like what what is your kind of take on this so, so what made you want to now like kind of we're on the we're on the same journey and we're gonna do a redemption podcast in six months so people can do a side by side that and we'll both be completely different looking um but yeah i mean dude i it comes down i mean literally this can this whole podcast or our existence in this world comes down to to one to one philosophy which is connecting the head and the heart right like I know what I need to do to thrive and be optimal in my performance as, as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a creative. Like, I know the things, right? If I, if I can wake up, spend some time, um, quiet time, reflection time, prayer time, um, I, if I know I can eat a good meal, eat good meals, clean, super clean diet, and good stuff that's going to nourish my body and not cause me to have big ups and downs, um, if I'm, you know, working out, 
and getting a good workout in and burning some some calories and doing different things like that. Like, I know I can perform at a higher level in my job and be better for my family. I was just about to say that. But, mm. again, it's that connecting the head and the heart. Like, I know all those things. It's head knowledge. You know those things. But when it comes down to application, there are a litany of factors that have delayed that process for us. And some of that might be, for me, trauma, um, depression at times, um, going through a lot of the things I've gone through in my life. I carry a lot of sadness. Um, and I'm working on some of that. I was actually before this, I was seeing my counselor and we were working through this stuff and I'm seeing him again. You know, we have a routine now for the next six months. We've set a lot of goals today and we're going to work on them. And I need to do better because I have people that depend on me, but more importantly, my, my boys, like my kids are going to watch this. Maybe my kids are going to watch my whole life and I'm going to say to them, you could be anything you want. And they're going to say, how come you're not? You know, and it's like, I I look at that and I say, I would do them a disservice to not be, I'm not perfect and I will never be perfect, but holy smokes, I know I can improve and holy smokes, I know I can do right by them and my wife and be around longer. You know, that's another thing. It's like when you're carrying unnecessary weight and I know I have been like, it's, it's taxing and it, and it will lead to a lot of problems as you get older and and nip it in the butt now will hopefully save me a lot of time to be on this earth with my kids and my family. I don't want to be, you know, the dad that has a heart attack at 45 and my kids are, you know, and then there's a stepdad in the picture and whatever, and at their graduation and at their weddings. And it's like, and, and a lot of times it comes down to choices we make and I have a choice. Look, I can get sideswiped on the way home today, but, but Mm -hmm. the things that are within my power, I need to take control over. Yeah. I definitely, you know, it's, you know, it's crazy. I, I thank you for sharing that one. And number two, that, that, that kind of epiphany kind of came to me too. You know, I, I really, when I, when I stepped off the plane back into Newark and was back in Jersey from Peru, like my, the trip to the journey in Peru, that's at some point I, I, I'll, I'll share, you know, was, was just really life changing to see like, you know, what people can do with what little they have and also the difference of appreciation for life, you know, um, the difference um, and just to like when I stuffed up that plane, I was like, OK, if I want to take take AO chill like to the next level, you know. I have to be like at my best. And I think that, you know, when I looked in the mirror, you know, it wasn't even just the fact that like I didn't like what I see, but it was like would this person be able to do like, you know, a 12 hour day if I needed to, you know, would this be somebody who like can lead by example, can lead in general, you know? And at at certain times it's just like, you know, it it, like the, the health conscious stuff, it it all has, has reasons, you know, sometimes in my age group where I'm at, you get a a lot pressured to do things. Uh, For example, like um, a lot of my friends, I mean, like we all smoke and uh i've been like and and i've been smoking a while and it's, it's never been a problem and then more recently like this past two months i was like you know i think i'm gonna stop smoking you know and it's like it's not that i'm gonna stop like you know using like weed or anything like i i i, I take edibles you know here and there for like you know uh, recreational or like before i go to sleep whatever but i was just like there has to be a healthier way to do this and now even looking into all the foods that we have you know i even have a problem with weed sometimes because i'm just like we don't know what pesticides are going into this. Like, we don't know all the things that different cannabinoids do. And, you know, we do know some things and there's more research going in. And once, um, hopefully, Congress will pass the a bill to um, not make uh, cannabis a, a Schedule One drug anymore so we can do more research and be allowed to do more research freely. But, you know, it just surprises me, like, how many things we get ourselves into and we don't even know what they're doing for us, you know? Um would you mind sharing at all like what have you found like do you have you kind of are you still on the journey of finding what has made you inconsistent in that or are you kind of you kind of like found that and now you're like working towards like reversing it i'm working on reversing it big time because i I, th- I think part of it is just like like you said like to be a good leader and lead by example you have to to do it you know and it's like m- 
there's a disconnect when you look at when you when I look at me and I hear the things I'm saying, there's a disconnect, right? Is that person really thriving? Is is what they have really good? Because it seems like not so much, you know, and there's truth to that. And I think that it does a couple factors. A, my family being there for them. They're the most important thing to me. Um, and then the business and, and how I present myself and like, look, whether you want to say or not in this world, I know there's been a lot of, you know, the body positivity movement can only go so far into science and facts. And I'm saying this as someone who knows that I'm not where I need to be physically. I am at risk severely and it's not my genetics. It's my fork. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, and I think that that is something that, you know, they, they were saying that like, people will say genetics, but really it's, it's, you know, nurture versus nature If your family comes from we like to eat in a Latin uh, household, you know, th- tortillas mm-hmm. around, um, you know, and what is, what is the statistic around uh, Latino families? Like the, the chance of childhood obesity is like through the roof. You get those little bimbo snacks yeah. and a little, little chocolate and a little you know, uh, pan dulce and, you know, and it's, it's good. It's good stuff. It's good stuff to have every once in a while, but like, it's also addictive. It's also, you know, doesn't make you feel good. And, and, but all this I'm trying to say is I, I just know that there's a real disconnect in what I'm saying and what I'm doing that needs to change. Um, and I need, and I'm the only one that can change that because when I'm sitting there on a zoom call or having a face to face with a client, like I'm representing the brand, you know, and I was watching this, um, I was watching this, uh, ad, and it was this guy selling charcoal and he was in the ad, you know, he's a big, he's a big dude, really burly, like messy beard. His hat, his hair was coming down, like sweating. And I'm like, this is the guy, you know, the, the, the person they chose to be. Cause in, there's a thing in marketing called aspirational marketing. And so it's like, you find your demo, but then you find someone like a little fitter, a little better looking, a little taller, a little tanner, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, so then your demo could look at that and go, Ooh, yeah, that's what I could be if I use this product. Um, but like this guy, I was like, this is the face of the company, you know? And it's like, it's sad that my mind went there and I don't mean to be mean, but also if I'm honest, I look at that for myself and I go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to clean some stuff up in my own act and how I look and how I present myself. Like this is something that I tell some of the guys I work with, like, if you're like, how come no one takes me serious? And how come I can't get a job? And it's like, I used to wear wolf shirts and a Batman belt. And I would sit there and go, how come I'm getting passed up for jobs? And it's like, bro. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying you got to wear a three piece suit, but like there's a disconnect between what you say you want to do and how you're showing up for the job. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just true in anything. It's like the end of the day, you got to be about that action. You got to take control of, you know, like your why and why you say you want to do things. It has to be consistent with your actions to do that thing. So if you want to be the next big movie composer, what are you doing right now? Well, you know, I'm just ticking around on my phone and, you know, listening to composers. It's like, well, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I find that the balance between now, you you know, it's crazy. I I, I will say this, and it's funny. I haven't I haven't really talked to anybody about this. Um, it's weird how my priorities have changed now since doing this health craze. Because I would want to say, I would like to say that, um, um, you know, before the before the start of of this season, my number one priority was my health. I took the prep time that I needed to kind of finally get into the the groove of everything because it took me a while to kind of like get into it. So when I stepped off the plane from Peru, it was like January 4th, 5th, somewhere around there, right? It took me until like the 16th, 18th of January to start getting into a workout routine and then um, prep my body for carnivore because carnivore is not something that you just jump into cold turkey it could be very unhealthy for you you need to listen to your body and learn your body um also helps to uh throw a sweet potato or an avocado in there for some fiber so you don't have those uh 
loose stools. Yeah, yeah, because that that was that was definitely like a, a huge thing that I ran into <laughs> the first couple of weeks, um, and like learning and, and like reading and, and educating more. But you know, now that I'm full into the season now and that we're just recording, um, I've I've had to like sacrifice a little bit of stuff where it kind of. I've been balancing out my emotions very, very hard, and it's not been anything that. Um, luckily, you know, I see my therapist pretty, pretty um, consistently, and I mean, I mean, like we we've been working. I feel like we've been prepping for this for years, and the hardest thing now is kind of like the effect that my drive and determination for my goals have had around, like I guess, like my friends. You know, um, for example, the other day, um, I mean, I wake up every day around like 5 40 almost six o'clock in the morning i'm in the gym by 6 30 latest mm-hmm. in the gym from 6 30 to 8 is my workout i get home around like 8 15 8 15 to like 9 30 i start cooking breakfast and i started doing all my chores that i need to for the day so i can make sure i come home and i'm clean like i have clean bedroom whatever and still working on that um 10 o'clock i'm in the studio in studio prepping phone calls emails editing I try to get out of, out of studio by six. So now, and I'm trying to get in bed every day by 10 p.m. And I've been staying very consistent to that for like the past month and a half. So that sucks because what does that mean? I have four hours of me time, you know. And that four hours of me time. Now I do I do that 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 um, schedule from Sunday to Friday, and then Friday nights and Saturday nights are my days off. Where I can actually, like, you know, I'll stay up past 10. I'll go out to a bar or I'll do this or, like, you know. And it's funny. I'm not even drinking right now either. Um, So, but uh, my point being is that now, like, for example, I came back home, like, the other day. And uh, my friend needed help with something. And I just realized I didn't get to spend any time with my niece. Didn't get to have any me time. Spent all day doing something that I didn't, like, not that I didn't want to do, but, like, doing stuff that, like, you know, didn't have my brain in a relaxed state. And now I'm going to sleep at 10 just to wake up and run it back and not have any time to, like, really relax until 6 o'clock, you know, the next day. And I think balancing out my emotions with that has been really tough, you know, not being able to be there for, like, and I don't know, maybe maybe this is a problem of my age uh, just because I, I want to do so many things. And, and I'm scared of missing out on things. But it's also, like, I feel like I have to pay the dividends of, like, the bad choices I've made beforehand in order to repair this, you know? Because there's a lot of similarities in the workflow that you put in the gym that I find with that you do as a creator, you know, as a filmmaker. It's like, you know, a movie. Like, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I know. I don't know if you work in the... Do you work in DaVinci Resolve or do you use Premiere? I'm trying to never edit again, but Premiere when I do. Okay. I actually have become a DaVinci Resolve head. I'm officially part of the Black Magic cult, unfortunately. Not saying that I don't like the other cameras because I barely know anything about cameras. But when it comes to editing and workflow, sure. you know, I love how DaVinci Resolve works. Yeah. Because I feel like it's very linear, whereas in, I feel like Premiere is very everything is at your hands and you really have to train to like know where everything is rather when da vinci like it kind of like this is here this is here and this is step one two three four and you could go in any step that you want but this is how the flow works and that has been like very beneficial to me and i'm just like all right i do this i do this i do that and then finally when i get towards that finish line you click the export and it starts rendering the gym I feel like it's a, it's a, it's the same thing, you know, and rendering in the gym life, I feel like is almost just like resting, you know, it's like resting. And then once you rest, like, here's your product, you know, you start up with the warm up, and you, you know, you start working out and then you do muscles, this, this, this cardio, and then boom. And then finally you get to the end, you rest and you run it back. And it's like doing another project, doing another project, you know, let me ask you this, excuse me. Um, you're 25 years old. And so I think your fear, you know, the fear of missing out, right? Like on what? Like, and I mean that in a provocative, provocateur way, like to, to challenge, like, because what's the alternative, right? Like you get to 30 and you're still in the place you were prior to coming back from Peru. Mm. You know, it, it's for who? 
Because I'll tell you right now, if you have any aspirations to have a family um, and to make this thing something that's going to be special, look, look, this can't be your only life and you have to have friends. You have to have community. That's important. But to your regimen that for the first time in a while, it sounds like, and, and I'm talking to myself here too, by the way, um, like that's so important. You need to like, you need to be okay with that. And you may let so-and-so down and maybe one of your friends will bro, you change, um, whatever, like that doesn't matter in the grand scope of things in five years from now. And you're looking back on all everything that happened and your progress and that day that you made a step and look, Will you make mistakes? Will you backslide? Will you um, have a cheat day or whatever? Like that's part of it. And you can't go to shame on yourself for all those things because it just happens. Consistency is not about being perfect. But look at the, the perspective of the next five years and where do you want to be? What do you want to be looking back at and proud of yourself that you did five years from now? You know, you'll be 30. You'll be 30 years old and you'll be able to say, yeah, look what we've done. Look what I've done built a team and look this being here till six thing right like it's important but as you scale and as you grow there may be someone that can help lighten that load and then maybe you're only here till four mm -hmm. you know and you start to be you know maybe you hire a couple people and you're you know you're you're doing the podcast and you maybe a little bit of pre and pre-interview and whatever and then you're out of here by two yeah. and you're doing another thing yeah, that's 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 really that's really the goal. That's really the goal and the dream and everything. Um, yeah, ah, man, I'll tell you what. Doing this, did you? So I know you talked about you know a little change in diet. Do, have you have you done anything with uh, working out yet or anything? Yeah, so I've been, I've gone once this week. Uh, I'm planning on going today, um, and because it's it's a little difficult right now with my wife being pregnant as well. And her mornings with the, the little one, mm -hmm. and he's you know, way more active and doing things. But I'm trying to go at least three to four times a week. Have you thought about a personal trainer? You know what? Here's what I think. I'm big on momentum being a thing. And look, not to say everyone's like this, but like, and my wife's going to love when she <laughs> hears that because she's like, what do I? Um, what I'm trying to do is like, okay, I know first and foremost, I've tried to just be like, I'm going to the gym every day. And I've tried all these other things, but it's like, I know there's things I need to work out emotionally. And so I've committed to go to my counselor for six months, not every day, um, twice a month, but you know, 12 sessions for the next six months. I've never done that in the past in conjunction with also changing my diet and being very strict about it and being very consistent with it. And I believe that as that starts to, they both start to happen, a consequence will be, yeah, Maybe I can get a little more serious about the, the workout thing and, and maybe have a trainer for a couple of days a week. And so I'm not opposed to it, Jamie. Uh, but yeah, I think I think for right now, just the money and, and, and the time and, and my schedule being the way it is, I, I you know, it's tough because there's any given day I can call and be like, hey, shoot Friday at two, you know, at 8 a.m. And it's like, hey, got to cancel that, you know, and it's like versus like I can do the shoot and then go to the gym at four, you know, and it's just like so. You know, I actually, I actually kind of have a question now with you doing this. You know, it's hard to be really vulnerable and, and get real like on a podcast. And especially I feel like in your situation where, you know, you're helping lead your, you know, your company and everything. Do you ever think that being this vulnerable or sharing too much can be a detriment to how the people who look to look up to you? Um, like, do you ever, do you ever think it could be a detriment to share too much? The only thing I, <laughs> the only thing I don't share, uh, my mom would always say, you know, I don't think you even knew, but I know parents will say like, don't share what you make, what your, what your father makes with, you know, but no, you know, I think at the end of the day, vulnerability begets vulnerability. And if that's the right word, I think that's, you know, trust begets trust. Like, like and I think that. I've always tried to be open. My, my mission in my life is trying to be open because if one kid could come up to me, kid, young man or young person could come up to me and say, me too, you know, like, Hey, I've been, through, I've been through that as well. And I know what it's like. Um, can we talk? want to get coffee. Like it's worth it to me. And so I don't see it as a weakness. Um, I see it as a strength in a culture where, you know, no one wants to be seen being weak. 
um, or the perception of weak that they've, you know, real men cry and all that stuff. But like, you know, it's like life is seriously hard and seriously not fair for a lot of people. And I've, despite my outlook, despite everything I have, I've had a really difficult life and have lost family members that I love, siblings, brothers, um, been through a lot of stuff and it's not been easy, but, but like, I know that me being vulnerable and open will hopefully open up other people to be vulnerable and open and me being open about getting help might make someone say, Hey, you know what? I've been dealing with this thing for a while. You know, I, I've been struggling with this thing for a while. Um, you know, and I think that that's important. And I think even for like you and me, like, you know, and if you don't want this, sorry, but like, I'd love accountability and what I'm in my process and what I'm doing with, with my diet and everything. Like, and I know it's hard to do it alone. So I'd love to like check in and like you and I maybe talk after this about stuff like that. Cause I think that'd be epic because it's hard to do it alone. Yeah, of course. And yeah, I would, I would love to do that too. Yeah. I've actually been trying to like reach out to more of the people who I've had on the podcast and just sending them a message here and there and just being like, Hey, like, how are you doing? Let me know like how life is. Um, I was going to ask something, but I, I completely, my mind just completely blanked out for a second. I was going to say when it comes to, actually, let me think here for a second. Let me just take a pause here real quick. Cause I just had it in my brain. And sometimes my my mind just blanks out. We will have a brief intermission, but we'll be back. I think this is a perfect place to play the ad, and then I'll edit that. Um, actually, let me think here for a second, because I was going to ask something that what were you just talking about? We were just talking about how checking in, being accountable, um, v- vulnerability. You think if it's if it's a detriment? If it's a detriment. Hmm. You know, I think when it comes to being vulnerable and, oh, now I know. I remember now. Boom, right there. Let's get it. As artists and what we do and being creative and everything that we do, I feel like for the longest time, uh, music, music for me specifically, because I mean, like, obviously creating and things is, is more new to me now than anything else, because music has been the only consistent in my life since probably since like third grade, you know, um, is when I first learned about my love for music. And I think that music in that sense has always been that thing that I use to escape from what I feared or the the struggles that i dealt with whether it was like for example growing up i had a lot of problems at home and i was involved in a lot of like you know um i i i had a, I had a weird upbringing too and, I, and i've talked about it before if you want to know it's on sully bob's podcast uh that he did with me on the bobcast you could check him out um i had a weird upbringing too which just involved like a lot of weird things um like drugs and um you know, weird addictions, like, you know, growing up and music, I always accredited it with the thing that saved my life. Um, and as I got older, I realized that I was using music a lot more as a crutch rather than enjoying it. And I realized that, you know, a lot of my creativity, you know, like whenever I had a problem, I was like, okay, cool. I could sing. I could play my instrument. I could run away from everything. And for a while, you know, when you have too much on your back you know it's it's almost like if somebody alleviates that from you you have kind of that extra strength now to put into other things and learn but if you don't learn what got you there in the first place then no matter who alleviates you know you for a bit or what alleviates from you for your for a bit if it comes back then it's like then you're just going to need help again 100 percent. yeah and it's like you you it's never bad to ask for help but it's i think it's not it's not a bad thing but it's a disservice to yourself to not learn or try to learn from the things that you are struggling from you know um for example um really weirdly i know i know this podcast has kind of taken a turn and everything but really weirdly <laughs> like my 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 mom when my mom passed i had a the weirdest reaction probably that I think anybody would have ever had to any of their family members passing 
which was I didn't cry. And it wasn't because I didn't need to. I did take the time. Like, when I needed to cry, I, I would cry. But, like, for the first week or two weeks of af- the aftermath, I was very much checking up on everybody else because it was during COVID. This was during, like, the complete lockdowns. So we couldn't see anyone. And I was just like, man, like, at that point of time, like, I have worked with my therapist so well. Me and my mom had such a great relationship where we had we were just able to talk about our traumas and everything and, and everything that got us through everything. So when it happened, I was just like, I'm ready for this. Like I like sure. th- this is so weird. It's it was super unexpected. Like and it caught us so far off of left field. But like I was like, I know everything I need to do right now. And what I feel bad, what I felt for was like the people who are going through the emotions they have to, and they're not able to go to a wake. They're not able to see my mom's body for the last time and all this stuff. So I was checking up on a lot of people. I'm like, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you did you ever find that you know you would run to work? or use your art as a way to escape, you know, the things that you were dealing with? You know what it is? I I go to other things, not my work. Um, I always wanted, because that's, because that's where it becomes like, and, and to your point, like about one thing I wanted to answer first to your point about like, if you don't know how you got there in the first place, you'll never like, there's this uh, there's this verse called uh, in, 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 in the Bible uh, where he says, uh, like a pig returns to the mud, as, as so a dog returns to vomit, you know, outside of the nature of something being changed. And I, and I believe that in my own life, like, unless I understand, you know, unless the nature changes and I come to that understanding of, like, how I got to that place in the begin with, like, I, you know, how many people do you hear go get lap band surgery? or all this other stuff. And then they're back to their same spot in a year or two. And it's like, unless you change the behavior, unless you change the, the, um, you know, what you do, um, and in the lifestyle change, it's not gonna, you know what I mean? Like you can go starve yourself and lose a ton of weight, but then you go back home and you're going to Dunkin' Donuts and Burger King and going ham in that area. Like it's just going to come back. So the behavior hasn't changed, you may have changed. You may like, Dog is still going to, if unless, you know, unless it's not a dog, it's going to eat its vomit. And a pig, you can clean it up real clean. And as soon as it sees a big pile of mud, it's going to jump right in. Um, so it's kind of like that, um, you know, for, for me is this like, that's why I'm trying to go about this time around with a very holistic approach and being like, I need to commit to, you know, and it's fine. It's also money is one of those weird things. There your heart is, there's also your treasure. Like when you complain about, that you need counseling, right? It's like, oh, I'd love to see someone, but I can't afford it. And then you can go, you got Netflix? You got this? You get a $5 coffee every day? It's like, I could find a hundred bucks real quick if you, if you, you know, and you prioritize what you actually, like what you value in life, you know? And if you go through someone, the biggest litmus test for any human being ever is their bank account. It tells you real quick what you value, what money goes towards effortlessly in your life. And if it's not self-care and taking care of your family and taking care of the things you need to take care of for you, then, you you know, it's like it's a, it's a telltale convicting thing going through your own financials and saying, what do I spend money on so easily? Food is a big one for our culture and for a lot of people. Spend 100 bucks a night, you know, going out. And I know people that were making good money in New York City and you'd see them on Instagram going out to restaurants and getting dropping a hundred bucks a night out with friends. Yeah. And then they're sitting there going and then living in a five thousand dollar apartment for like a broom closet and they're just like, I just don't make enough money. We need to tax the rich more. It's like mm-hmm. oh, bro, this is nothing to do with the rich. <laughs> you're trying to act like the rich and you're not, mm-hmm. you know, living beyond your means. But like, you know, so that that's one thing. And then what was the other question you asked me? Um work. Do I take work as like a a crutch yeah. or like something like that. No, you know what? I just, I leave that stuff at home. <laughs> like I just, you know, not the like, you know, but I just, it's not really like that for me. You know, work has got to be, I used to watch movies a lot and that was kind of my escape in high school when yes, stuff was going down for my brother and I worked at a movie theater. I was literally like a walking distance and I would just go to the movies, but like that's not too much anymore. You know, it's like kind of let that stuff go. And focus on building work to be a good culture and, and equitable and chair. You know, one of the thing I want to talk about, I know we're going up on time, um, but um, we're chilling. As long as you're chilling, I'm chilling, man. Chilling. Yeah, yo, chill. Um, 
you know, we are in the process of building a team, and right now, um, people who are paid, um, and my crew, my team, um, to be there are we have. seven people it's which is nuts and they're all great and we are really earnestly trying to build something that's really special and different and i think part of how i want to structure that and and going forward is like i said this to someone before but it's like i i know that that's not the end like we're going to really grow this thing and to be something special and i need to lead leaders like and the people who we have now are, are my team. I want them to run the thing uh, eventually so that I can focus on other things. Like I want to make movies and w- the way I want to do it, you know, especially asking this team to come on and be a part of shooting a, a short film. Basically one of my goals this year is to save a significant amount of money so that we can produce in house our own short film. And we, a few friends of mine produced a short film out in Ohio a couple of years ago And it was a decent budget, but then when you find out that, oh my gosh, you know, to get it scored, to get it colored, all these other things, like it's a lot of money edited. Um, And so I want to raise enough that we can fund a film, but then I also don't want it to be the Sean Conlon project. Like I want to have everyone on my team be a part of a first round of submitting a script and the best script is going to get voted for, and we're going to tell the best story. And whoever that person is, it could be Norman, Pablo, Noelia, whoever is on the team, um, their script might be better than anything I, I have in my repertoire. And we would, you know, they, they'd be whatever position they want to be. And, and that gets people to buy in and be excited because it can't just be this thing where I maximize profits. And like, but like truthfully, I'm not taking a dime um, from the company in the last month and a half, two months. Um, part of that has been because we have new people and we're trying to keep things afloat. And it's been a, sl- it, this is usually the slower season in life. As soon as the weather starts to get nicer in March, April, May, June, busy July and August. Mm, and then all of a sudden like Labor Day weekend hits. And it's like that till middle of December is just nuts. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a little break around Thanksgiving, but that's about it. And so right now, you know, we've had the, the pleasure of like not having a ton of work to just kind of, or, or the opportunity rather to just kind of build the company. What is this place going to be? You know, who do we want to be? Um, there are people who don't even work for us that still come in and use our space. Cause I want this to be a resource for anyone and everyone who wants a place to work. And our office is not huge, but, but it's a resource because I didn't have those things when I was 21, 20 and I had to go work at a Starbucks and that's fine. You could do that. I do it every once in a while, but it's nice to have a place where there's a couch, there's Keurig coffee, there's, you know, snacks, and the fridge is filled with drinks and different things. Um, and some people might call me a fool for that. Some people might say, ah, oh, I don't know, spending money on, you know, it's not that much money. But, you know, but it's like I want people to have a place where they feel comfortable to work. Um, but then what are our goals? What are we doing? What's the company about? And there's a lot of stuff I could talk about. But yeah there's a- when it comes to you know you know it's wild i think this is a good uh kind of pivoting point i've never been a movie person and i actually said that last time we were doing a podcast oh yeah i said i'd never come on again i forgot <laughs> <laughs> next time ever. and funny enough um last time we spoke to i talked to you about how i had a class that kind of changed my perspective of what i wanted to do mm-hmm. and at one point i thought i was going to be like uh um a uh, sound editor for movies. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't That's work right. out. That's right. Uh, well, I'm actually glad it didn't work out because if not, we wouldn't be sitting here. But I still have a, I have a huge passion and love for it. And I actually recently got the AMC um, Stubbs Pass where I get three movies a week. And uh, I started doing it because I, I, I don't know what came over me, but I was just like, I want to start watching movies. Like, I, oh, I had watched two movies in Peru. This is what had changed it. I watched two movies in Peru, and uh, I watched them on my own time because I had some free time, and I was just with the iPad, you know, in, in, in my house. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll watch a couple of, like, uh, whatever they're called, um, awarded films or whatever. And there was this one that was called uh, Marcel the Shell. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but that movie made me cry so hard. Um, and the concept of the movie is literally like 
uh, it I, this it used to be a YouTuber, and it, it was a YouTuber turned turn movie, which usually is not never like the greatest like crossovers ever. No. But it's like this little like shell that has a googly eyeball and two oh. tiny shoes, and the whole concept of the movie is like uh, Marcel the shell like lives in a house and has like a shell community and doesn't know anything about life in general. And this person, um, the house gets rented out as, as an Airbnb. And this guy comes in who's a YouTuber and he starts filming and doing like podcasts, I guess, with Marcel Deschel and Marcel's like learning about life. Huh. And I don't know how that concept led to me bawling my eyes out twice to this movie. Uh, but after I closed the movie, I was like, this is one of the greatest things I've seen in a while. And I was just like the impact that that movie had on me and, and just like leaving that and being like, wow, like my life is one percent better from watching that i was like i need to watch more movies like why well, haven't ever watched too many movies and there's a lot of movies i haven't seen that are classics like i have never seen um what's the one with uh uh samuel L. jackson and john travolta i think that's uh, uh it's a it's a what you call it movie as the cover of the girl with black hair <laughs> short bangs yeah, yeah yeah it's a uh, ah oh, jeez 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 um People are going to be so mad at me. It's okay. Um, <laughs> um, who's the filmmaker uh, that did all those movies? Uh, Mar- not Martin Scorsese. Um, he did Inglorious Bastards. Um, you know, like Steven Spiel? Oh, no, I don't, no, no, I don't know. Oh, names, my gosh. Be I can't believe I'm, I'm not. I can't believe I'm blanking on this. This is big. <laughs> but um, yeah. The film um, community can take my card. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I haven't seen movies like that. Uh, but I recently, like, I just like the concept now of like sitting down and like being like, I want to experience something. I want something to make me feel. Have you ever seen Lion? No. I don't think a movie in theaters has ever impacted me more. I walked out and I didn't like talk for a day. And then I did a little more research about a lot of the human trafficking. Like, so basically it's about this little boy who is going with his brother to run an errand and he gets on a train and like the train takes off and his brother, he misses his brother and he gets basically for a year or two, he's on his own and people are trying to catch him to like in India, little kid in India. And eventually he gets adopted by this couple um, in Australia that bring him in and they love him and they treat him really well, but he's always had these memories of his old life and longing to, to find these people. And he kind of suppresses it for a long time. Then long story short, he ends up finding his birth mother and his village. And it's like really sad. And it's like really awesome. And I was just like, but when you understand like what little kids like him go through every single day and then you understand how horrible the human trafficking market is in the world and you start to realize that there are a lot of these little videos that leak and then porn companies profit from it. It's like, it's a dark and it made, I think at the time it came out, 2016, 15, it made me like, you know, um, I was like, I, you know, I'll be honest, you know, pe- people struggle with porn and, and that's a whole other conversation for a whole other topic as mm-hmm. far as the addictability and how it kind of crushes your brain and it's awful. Um, objectifies women you could say whatever you want but it's it's not good um but the fact that a lot of these sites profit from real footage of people that are in human trafficking it's just like oh it's so dark yeah and it made me be like nope nope done nope and, the, and never the fil- and the film just well oh, yeah so how like we don't have to get into the film but i think that kind of just adds to the point of just like if something is made well you know what I mean? And that's kind of what I've been getting to at with movies yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, Like, just, like, being, like, the sound behind it. Mm-hmm. The shots, the angles. You seen Sound of Metal? I haven't. Amazon. Go watch it tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow. It's about a drummer who goes deaf, and the sound design is insane. I watched it with a buddy of mine who had a little meter to get the decibels and stuff while we were watching it. We were just like, wow, the frequencies. Yeah, it's. I watched it with a drummer friend of mine, and he loved it. Oh, wow. you, you know it's funny. I I've just have gotten into. I just watched Whiplash for the first time. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just watched Whiplash, for, and that 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 film actually kind of hit me like at home because I grew up grew up and got into music through the classical route, and that movie is kind of like I want to say it's over dramatic because. It's pretty, but it's pretty on point of how like the classical industry kind of still is today. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's 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 uh, they're intense. Yeah, it's 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 a weird thing. Like, even like with the kids. you think gangster rap's cool or intense? <laughs> try joining a jazz band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try joining. Try doing jazz. You know, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty tough. But yeah, um, I I recently watched uh like for example the most recent film I saw was uh, Cocaine Bear, and <laughs> um, did you watch Cocaine Bear? Uh, I've heard of it. It's pretty. It's pretty wild. I wouldn't say it's like anything like crazy, like super different. But uh, when it comes to like feeling emotions and stuff, even I've been really getting into trailers as well. And and like, oh yes, guess what? Um, we are in pre-production for a trailer, not a movie, not a short, a trailer. So I'm not gonna even spoil the beans. I'll tell you offline about it because you guys will see it. It's gonna be insane friend of mine a group of friends of mine oh my god i didn't even tell you what happened to me over the summer tell me oh god <laughs> let's get into it <laughs> dude this uh, skip all this could be another episode because holy smokes are you ready for this i'm ready now <laughs> dude this is gonna be my tell all right here but we were oh, i almost <sighs> so this is, I got a call from some guy, producer down in Florida. He said, hey, you want to work on this reality show? So what's it about? It's this, oh, I don't want to get, screw it. I'm just going to do it. Uh, it's this reality show about this billionaire woman who graduated high school at 14. She has private chefs. She's trying to buy a huge neighborhood in Monroe, New York. I don't want to give everything away, but anyway, she's trying to buy a huge neighborhood and basically build houses, uh, office houses and have people work and basically build like a think tank, like, like a big, um, like Silicon Valley almost with coders and all sorts of creatives and people. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. And they're like, yeah, so it's going to be like six days of work a week or more. And we're going to have you, you know, I, I think I was negotiating between what I was going to be writer, producer, director. So I ended up being a director of the show. And so me and me and 20 other, 30 other people from New York City and New Jersey and the surrounding area show up on this insane property with insane things, tons of limos, tons of cars, tons of servants, tons of, and it was nuts. So we were all there all summer long. She took us out to the Hamptons and like these stretch, um, sprinters and put us up in like million dollar houses and like had a ton of challenges like one of her employees she's like you like that ev6 and he was like yeah and she's like if you sleep in it for uh seven nights i'll give you five thousand dollars every night you stay in it and you can keep the car and we filmed it there was all sorts of insane challenges all sorts of insane stuff um and it just made no sense and it was nuts and it turned out to be we think a big ponzi scheme um, they like stopped paying the company that hired us all. Um, at the end, I got paid uh -huh. everything I was owed. Um, but like, and then my wife got a job with her and they like gave her an insane salary. And then all of a sudden, like one day, just like laid her off and everyone else. And like, it was just nuts, but it was nuts. I could, we could make a whole episode just about that whole experience because I could tell you some crazy stuff and by and large, it was great. The money was good, but mm -hmm. man, it was nuts. Did and the show ever come out? It never will. We're pretty sure that they're a huge scammer. We looked into her like history and stuff. And like, she wrote like a book about Michael Jackson and like said she was a 10th degree black belt and a dietitian and a doctor. And we like, the only thing she ever ordered, she would order like insane catering all the time. Like she probably spent $4,000 on Dunkin' Donuts every day at the wow. house. All these employees, all these people working the grounds, a private driver, private chefs, all sorts of stuff. It was nuts. All these elaborate things. And then um, these big events where they would fly in like a bunch of models and bodybuilders and like do these like insane commercials. It started off as a reality show and then the scope quickly changed. It was nuts. But we're all kind of trauma bonded. And at one point, here's what she said to me. She, she was telling me this crazy idea. And she goes, you know, could you do this? You make this into a film? And I was like, uh, maybe. And she's like, how about like right now, can you do it in 72 hours? I was like, no, no way. She's like, what if I paid you a lot of money and give me a check for a certain amount of money? And I was like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we could do it. We can figure it out. <laughs> and so we did. And she wrote me a check 
for a lot of money, like a lot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right. And she just did stuff like handed, gave a car to someone else, gave a, you know, like. And it was like legit, like, or. Yeah. But then at the end, it wasn't like at the end, we realized we probably all were just a part of like a Ponzi scheme or a tax scheme or whatever, because she just cut everyone off, stopped paying the company, told all these people they loved her. No, told, told all these people that she loved them. She would do everything with them. And then when it came to like them all getting let go, it was like, Pfft. see ya. Like, stop paying the guy that hired us all from Florida. Like, it was just a big SHIT show and never any direction. At one point, she's like, I don't want to be in it anymore. We're like, what? It's a show? <laughs> she's like, yeah, don't mic me either. And the sound people were like, what are we supposed to do? It's like, yeah, I don't know. Figure it out. The boom guy was like the whole time. Like, <laughs> um, but we all became good friends. And a lot of people in that photo that I posted the other day mm-hmm. were from that production because we're all kind of like drama bonded. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was insane. Dude, we do have to take an episode to do it. Let me check how, how we're doing on time here. We actually are coming pretty close down to it because I actually probably have to start cutting off soon. But is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that you wanted to get off your chest before we start closing out? Um, yeah. The floor is yours. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, and I think this is an important topic, you know, and, and maybe it's buying into like what we're trying to do. Ferrum Creative, my my company, which is going to be my branding marketing, my brand centered marketing company that's going to be basically brand first, doing a lot of different content for e commerce and direct to consumer. That's not officially launched yet. We're in the process of building a website. That's going to be hot. I'm so pumped about that. But right now, some of the stuff we're doing for Ferrum Films has been really rewarding, really cool, mentoring a lot of people, um, working on some really fun projects. I said this the other day to someone, and I think it makes a lot of sense. One of the reasons why I was able to build this company the way I have was because, and right now, if you look at the stuff we post, like there's a difference between the quality of the stuff we post and the work we we post like a long time ago i stopped saying yes to everything this maybe goes back to the whole saying yes to everything um and maybe i used this example last time i was on but i just want to demo this a little bit so just for people to understand like i think that for me one of the one of the strengths i had was the foresight of seeing the bigger picture right so I was the guy doing videos, a couple grand a pop, you know, for little short videos, whatever, you know, social media videos, stuff for people for online, whatever. And then all of a sudden the client came with a bigger budget. And I've seen a lot of people in this realm. You know, there was, there was some person that I worked with that had an opportunity to make a feature project and there was a huge budget attached to it. And this person, instead of using the budget to bring on good people and rent good equipment, bought stuff for themselves, you know, nice little tripod, nice new this, $10,000 here, $20,000 here on stuff for themselves. And the project looked like crap. And so in my mind, I'm just like, when you have the opportunity, like if I'm the, if I'm the, let's just use fake numbers. If I'm the $4,000 video guy, right? That's me. I'm comfortable being there. Let's just say, and I have a client that's like, yo, we got a $25,000 budget coming up for this project. Would you you want to put the team together and do it? I'm not going to go, oh, shit. I'm just going to pay $4,000 to my people I normally work with, and I'm going to profit 21000 bucks. Like, if I want to be taken serious and be in that stratosphere of that new level of work, I'm thinking about it going, okay, I'm going to make my... 15, 20, 30%, whatever you're comfortable making as a business owner of mm-hmm. the project. And then I'm going to put the rest into making this the best project I can because I'm thinking I'm going to leverage this to then sell to more people in that range. Um, and I think that that's been a big benefit to us. And I, and I think not being afraid to bring on people who are better than us, like we've gotten calls from other production companies, other people that are like, Oh, you know, what are you guys doing? And like asking for little tips and some of them just being a little creepy and kind of poking around. Um, Mm -hmm. but I have a ceiling. You have a ceiling. We all have ceilings, right? Like that's why bringing on good guests because there's only so much about certain topic you could talk about, but someone else might crack to that ceiling and you might learn a couple things and you might take a step forward in that area. 
Um, you know, in five years, you might be talking to young professionals about pricing and what you learned about that kind of stuff. But anyway, we have people kind of calling up and asking us questions about X, Y, Z. But like when you look at their work, you see, oh, that's that's Sean. Let's just say Sean does an OK job, but it's never going to be anything besides Sean work. And for me, when the right client comes along, it behooves me to step away from from those kind of operations as far as the shooting goes and bring on someone who's a real killer and who's really good and better than me because they're going to make something that's going to look really nice that I'm going to use to then leverage that work to get more work in that area. And I think sometimes you got people who are like, I'm the director, producer, shooter, X, Y, Z. And it's like, your work looks like it. Like, you know, and it's like, that's a big lesson to young people right now that are trying to build a brand, trying to build a company and want to be taken serious by potential clients that they're going to go to and be like, yeah, that'll be $20,000. Like clients aren't dumb. They're going to look at your work and go, uh, eh, I don't know, junior, you know, like and yeah. I'm not saying that to be disrespectful, but it's, but it is what it is, you know? And it's like, I would say that to anyone. It's just like, you know, and I, and I look at the way that, and so how have we kind of solved for that? Right. I guess that's the whole point is like, Ferrum Films has become not just a production company. Obviously, you can white label us. Like you get the big job and you want it to look good and you're going to throw whatever towards towards us and having a crew to come do it. Like that's, you know, like that's a huge service that we provide for people because there are a lot of companies from outside of the L.A., you know, in L.A., Atlanta, whatever, that come to New York and they don't have boots on the ground. They have to maybe put together one person they know and then have find a bunch of help to come work on a job versus a team that does really good work. So white labeling us, I want Ferrum Films to not just be a production house, which is essential, but we are basically, we're an add-on. We're the plug-in, you know, like the, mm-hmm. instead of a Da Vinci light, we're a Da Vinci full, you know, we're mm-hmm. a nice little plug-in to make your life easier. And so we're leveraging a lot of those similar things that the time aspect, like if you're, I was there with my RAV4 loading every piece of gear I possibly had. And then when I got to the sidewalk, everything on the sidewalk and the client's just sitting there like annoyed because it's a huge mess. So what do we do? We bought a van. We have the ramp on the van and we have hampers. All of our stuff goes in hampers Mm -hmm. because when we roll up to a shoot, we roll up in style. We got the van, the ramp goes off and the, the hampers, three little hampers come off with all the gear in it. There you go. Wheel it in. It fits in every single Uh, door in New York City, you know, uh, commercial buildings. And so those kind of things in like, you know, we say filmmaking down to a science. I don't know if you checked out the new brand with all the science stuff and Leo and all those guys, you know, filmmaking down to a science because we really have taken a look at all the pain points that bog down filmmakers and, and said, okay, we have a solution for that. And if you got a nice budget on a project, us charging you to come deliver and drop off gear is a drop in the bucket, bro, like to your bigger process. And I guess my point that I was trying to make with the pricing stuff and is, and I'll tie this up, like you have to have the humility to know when there's a thing that's above your, like I'm all about making money, you know, that's great. And, but like, I think at the end of the day, like it's the whole saying yes thing, right? Like, and, and sometimes saying yes to the right client when you don't have the ability to service that client also comes back to bite you in the ass because you're doing things the cheap way. It's a $25,000 client. You're doing things the way you've been doing things as a $4,000 video vendor. And Hey, where's the edit? Well, I'm working on all these other projects for $4,000. So I know it's been, I've been hard to get a hold of. And I know, and also like I'm shooting it on my black magic, but really I probably should have shot it on a, a different camera with a maybe easier workflow um, because they wanted the edit in a week or two. Um, and maybe, you know, like the look wasn't the best and the lighting wasn't the best because I'm doing things, I'm bringing this light instead of bringing a grip team and, and lighting from the outside. And, mm-hmm. and so it's like, if you want to retain clients in that area and you start to get pulled out of, like you can use, you can leverage other contractors and other people to help pull you through your ceiling and continue to level up. And then now you have a nice shiny new piece of work in that range and you use that to market and shop to other people in that range. But I think so many people are so focused on their thing that they never see outside of that. And then when they do get a big fish, they try to catch the big fish with conventional methods that they've been using. And either they get, either it gets to the phase where, 
you know, in the pitch process where the other, you know, the company clearly looks at their work and says, no, thanks. Or they do the project and then under deliver and then never get that kind of work again, specifically mm -hmm. with that client. And I think that's an important thing that we're trying to add value and finding a way to communicate that that doesn't sound arrogant, you know, and it's more of like a experience thing. I think is what we're trying to figure out right now because we want to make ads for it. We want to start marketing to other production companies to say, Hey, we figured some of this stuff out. You keep all your money. You just hire us like you would hire anyone and we'll come do the work. White label us. They, we could be on the, on the thing. It could say, yeah, it's uh, this team. It's Nicholas cage productions mm -hmm. and we'll just come and work and do the job and help you, you know, from start to finish. But I don't think that a lot of people have the wherewithal or maybe even the humility to say, yeah, it wasn't me that shot it, you know? And it's like, it's okay that it wasn't you. There's a lot of projects. I have my website that I didn't shoot, but my team did and people I hired did. And that's the point. Son. Yes. We talked a lot of, about a lot of things today. Oh yeah, we did. Um, funny enough, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting the journey we were going on today. I didn't know where we're going. And it's so funny whenever I'm surprised, it's always a good thing because I'm always like, wow. I was like, I had no idea what to expect. And I, and, and I really enjoyed today. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you for coming on again. This mm -hmm. won't be the last time, obviously, that you'll be here. We'll be talking again sometime soon. I don't know, maybe like a six month checkup. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know like maybe I'll, 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 send, I'll send you. I'll invoice you. I'll invoice you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll invoice you too. We'll cancel them out. Son, please let the people know where they could find you, everything, socials, anything you want to promote, any shout outs. Now is the time to do it. Shout out to my wife. She's my my rock, my best friend. Love you for all your support. You're the best, and you do a great job. Best mom in the entire world, first and foremost. You're right, boys. You got to take care. Take care of the ladies in your life. Um, next shout out to you. I, I, you're a delight to talk to, and you're a Thank really you, good dude. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, it. You could find me on Instagram. You could find me. I tweet some things every once in a while. Sean Conlon underscore. Um, and Ferrum Films at Ferrum Films uh, on Instagram and at Ferrum Creative and at Ferrum Views, which is the new thing we're doing with Leo. But besides that, you know what? I'm kind of trying to uh, change up my strategy on social a little more to be a little more of a, a value add to people in this space. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see some original content at some point soon nice. coming out. Nice. And I'm pumped about that. So. Yeah, we got some things to say. And so hopefully some people enjoy it and get some value from it. Awesome. And guys, you already know the business. Ayo Chill Podcast, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, wherever you find your videos, wherever you find your podcast, we are there. Um, website coming soon. Merch coming soon. And um, yeah, I think that's it. We just got to get out of here. Yeah, let's go. Right, let's go. <laughs> I ain't bad, man. That was sick, dude. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, dude.